Thanks um, very much, Marie. When Marie asked me to uh, do this talk a few weeks ago, she didn't tell me I was going to be the last talk of the meeting, but uh, I'll try and keep you awake. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the idea of this talk was um, I got involved um, about nine years ago with uh, Marie and Larry and Auxilium. And uh, it was the first time I've ever actually been involved with a big international study. I've written uh, several papers and uh, presented a lot. Uh, but they've all been small series and case presentations, etc. This was a whole new experience and I do strongly recommend it to everyone to, to do this because it will solve some of the problems that you've been talking about. Um, my disclosure has obviously been involved with um, Auxilium um, with, for research funding and uh, with Actilium. And the other thing is I do have, also have uh, early Jupitron's contraction. This is the invitation that came, came for this meeting. Now, when we in Australia get an invitation to a meeting somewhere else in the world, we often think twice about it because you can see where Australia is and you can see where the rest of the world is. So it takes us a long while to get from some pla one place to another. We are actually closer to Antarctica than just about anywhere else in the world. I have been to Antarctica and I took this photo. And in Antarctica, there's approximately 20 million penguins. Now, that's approximately the, the population of Australia. And I can assure everyone that I did not see any penguins with Jupitrons. So if I want to do a study on Jupitrons, I can't go to Antarctica. I've got to go somewhere else in the world. And that's what happened now uh, in 2006 when I became associated with Auxilium. I did have this opportunity to um, get involved with a bigger population. Since then, I've been involved with multiple trials since 2006. These are the trials I've been involved in. And you can see many of those are, or a couple of those are in Australia, but many are actually in association with people in the European Union and the United States. So they're all international trials, except for a couple of them. And they've all worked very well, as you've probably read in the literature. There are many advantages and disadvantages to doing such a thing. It will depend on what we're studying. Um, data collection is fairly straightforward now um, to do that, but tissue collection is difficult. Um, a few years ago, Paul asked me and Guido asked me to get involved in their uh, study with the genetics. And I was interested, but we got to the stage where I had to send tissue to uh, Los Angeles, I think it had to go. For us to do that, we had the company organised, but the cost became astronomical to keep it frozen, etc. So data collection is pretty straightforward nowadays, but tissue collection is going to be a problem, which may be something that Charles might have to think about. Also, doing surgical techniques, that's very difficult to do, uh, to do a study with surgical techniques in different countries, because all, each country's got a little different ways. You also need to consider the patient population. For example, Jupitrons is rare in Asia, so you probably don't want to do a study with people in Asia. And similarly, melanoma is common in Australia, but probably not so common in Sweden or Norway. So you've got to think about the country that you're going to get involved with. The big advantage is that your numbers increase. And that's, as we've said, that's what we need for Jupitrons. We need to increase our numbers. You can get large series very quickly, which you cannot do with a country like Australia with a small population. For example, the five-year follow-up, which we heard talked uh, presented at this meeting, there was 950 subjects and 1,081 joints. It would take us a long while to do that in, uh, in Australia. You also get a variation in your popu population subjects, so it gets rid of some of the biases by getting rid of lar both large numbers and different populations in different countries involved. And it may reduce some of that genetic or country or external in influences that we've heard about. It also probably helps spread the cost for the different countries. The different countries may have some industry and research foundation and even charities um, that may assist in your individual country and helps spread the load of the cost. So the big disadvantage though is this cost problem. So there's Australia again. And there we are there, that's where I live. And this is where we all are, the, the people who have been involved. So it's a long way around the world um, to uh, get involved in, in trials. But the digital age has made the world a lot smaller. And that's the thing that's made things better. And 
as we just heard. People are sending electronic forms out and doing crowdsourcing and things, which is a whole new thing. The other disadvantage with the cost is you need all the clinicians to follow the same procedure and protocol. You need to all know what you're talking about and what you're going to, what's going to happen. You may need to attend a training course pre, pre, before the trial starts. In June 2008, when we were starting there, we did the CORD 1 and CORD 2 trials. I had to go from Australia to, to Chicago to uh, review the initial trial results so we could talk face to face. That was for a weekend, which was 20 hours or more flying each way. I didn't get jet lag because it was an over and back and it was, <laughs> your head was going round. But that's the sort of thing that you may have to um, do. In uh, January 2010, I did the first um, multi-cord injection in a trial and um, that we didn't know what was going to happen when we put double the dose, whether the hand was going to fall off or what was going to happen. So the vice president of Exilium flew from Philadelphia and the chief pharmacist flew from the United Kingdom to Australia to see what was going to happen to that patient. And they all came in, we stood outside and we all looked at the patient and thought, I wonder if their hand's fallen off. And as we found out, it hadn't. That was the proof of concept uh, trial that we did. It's been published. And following that, we did all the other multi-trials. But so they flew from the other side of the world just to see what was going to happen. Well, more costs again. Um, the thing that you might need is teleconferences. There's a little bit of a cost there, but that, that's very useful and it saves a lot of travel. Skype and uh, multiple other uh, devices, that will help um, with uh, travel. Um, electronic case report forms, that's also very useful, a little bit like Charles has set up. You need to duplicate and standardise all your instruments. Some of the ones we did the nodule studies uh, just recently and we had to use durometers, so they had to be sent from America, so we all had the same devices and the same machines and the same measuring techniques. Drug transport, that becomes difficult sometimes. The collagenase, for example, needs to be refrigerated and ours is all imported from the United States. Blood, urine, tissue samples, all the collagenase patients had those taken. They have to be sent off and uh, preserved and sent to the other side of the world. Again, more costs and difficulty. And also, when you start sending things around the world, things get lost. So that's another problem that you may have to face. And also customs. You start sending tissue from one country to another. You know, just if possible. We didn't have that problem, but it could happen. Then you need to consider the aims of your trial. The aims of the trial may vary with different companies, countries, such as with collagenase, as we've heard, it was pretty straightforward in the, in the United States. It's only recently been started in Australia. Europe's had difficulties in getting it in, so you do this big trial and then it doesn't end up in your country. So, you know, so what have I, why have I done this? The, also, the country outcome may be difficult, the different regulatory authorities, the social outcomes, quality of life, employment, that, that will all be affected by whatever you're looking into with your uh, outcome. And also the bar may be higher or lower in some countries. The complication implications may vary. Uh, you, you might worry about lawyers if your, your flex attendants start rupturing, for example, and that may vary in different countries. So if things go wrong, you've got to be a bit cautious. And also the aims will differ, differ if you've got a, a, a industry versus a straight investi investigative trial. So if, after you've considered all those things, you've got to think, is this still worth doing and getting involved with? All trials that you do get involved with must follow the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki, which has been, uh, which now has 35 principles that must be followed. The main thing is that you need to protect the patient's health. So if you're going to get involved with this, you've really got to be uh, particular, and that takes precedent over everything else that you're getting, uh, that you're doing. The trials must always be um, conducted by qualified professionals. Um, all subjects must have informed consent and you need to assess the efficacy and the progression and the safety of a disease. So all research must be ethical and monitored. I would strongly recommend you all getting, if you don't go straight with a company, to have a contract research organisation or a CRO involved. They really make life easy and they know what they're used to doing it and they know what to do. Again, it's a little bit more cost. Um, we've got uh, one called Novatech in Australia that really basically kept everything in order. Also, if you are going to use a local CRO, they must have international accreditation if you're going to be involved in an international trial, and they don't all have that. The CROs, though, they do give you a lot of clinical trial support, coordination, documentation, assist in the import of the drugs, for example, and keeping all the data. 
They assist in the recruitment of the patients if you need to advertise, for example, and also the planning, where it's going to be, uh, the, the organising the, the timings, etc. And that was very important when we had collagenase. The CROs will also audit everything and they will keep accurate records and you must keep accurate records and that was the thing that impressed me and drove me mad sometimes with the Exilium trials is that the, everything was so accurate. And as the FDA says, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And similarly, if it isn't written down correctly, it didn't happen. And the number of times we had to sort of initial things that we, little changes, and you, you yeah. I, I can see Gary shaking his head over there. <laughs> so. um, the other thing with the CRO is they will give a centralised statistical analysis, which is very good, and they retain the data for two to five years, which is important with trials. Then you come to ethics. All human research needs ethical review. And that, again, can vary between countries. And getting approval is sometimes a very difficult and slow thing. And also, all clinicians must follow that so-called good clinical practice. And to do that, you need a Human Research Ethics Committee, or HRC. They do ensure that strict ethics compliance. We've got one, there's Belbury, which is one of the ones we've used in the trials. And they advise, and they often get much faster ethics approvals for you, so it's really worth using them. And all the participants, both the staff and the patients, must have the informed consent with all the risks, benefits, sponsors, funding, information, use, uh, confidentiality, everything has got to be explained to, to them with the ethics. And all adverse and serious adverse events, as uh, Marie said yesterday, if they sneeze, you've got to write it down. So I strongly recommend getting a single organiser in the primary country who write the protocol and the rules and coordinate the results. They'll keep it a strict protocol for all um, participants. They have all the inclusions, exclusions. You need to work out your randomised ratios. Many of our trials were double-blind randomised trials and that needs to be worked out beforehand. Um, an example was one of the, uh, the, uh, the first multi-injection multi trial we did, which had 20 subjects, but there was 85 pages of protocol uh, in that small series. So it was done in great detail. And that's what you're going to need if you're going to do an international trial. You need to sign your non-disclosure confidentiality clause. You also should have a principal investigator at each site. That, that's someone, that was often the case there. They're the one that signs all the forms and uh, the one that gets rung up all the time. And they're also responsible that protocols are followed. And you may need to travel or do teleconferences, as you heard. So you need one person in your country, one person in that country, or at least once the site, the main site. They also often end up being the primary author of the publication, which I guess is one of the trade-offs. So overall, I do recommend participating in international trials. It does broaden your experience. It will be a challenge, and there are a lot of rules to be followed. It will take up a lot of your time. It uh, does broaden your trial and data possibilities, gives you much more uh, information, and you may end up proving or disproving treatments, such as we have with collagenase over the years. You will meet and you'll make many new international colleagues. And it also increases your, your personal international status. These are some of the publications that have resulted from some of this research, and there's two right now that will be published uh, very shortly in the uh, Journal of Hand Surgery. So, and the final thing is, it, as well as that, it allows you to come and talk at such superb meetings as this one has been. Thank you.